Here we go. Yes. Doing it again. Yep. Yep, yep, yep.
Well, good afternoon and welcome everyone to the Glenview New Church this afternoon for this service to celebrate the life of Jean Foster Melzer. It's nice to see you all here this afternoon and to have met some of the extended Melzer family. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, it sounds like the Melzer family has been a significant name in the Glenview history. And either that's true, or there are just a number of people in my congregation who like to talk about all of you. <laughs> so you sound significant. But it is nice to have met uh, a number of you, and I'm sure I'll get to meet a number more of you as the day goes by. You know, as I think of Jean, I think of the many times that, I've had, that I had a chance to visit with her in her home and then at Covenant Village, different places that she lived. And the thing that I really enjoyed the most, the most about her was her warmth and her communicative spirit and how much she loved and even longed for human connection uh, and warmth. Um, it was really such a pleasure to know her uh, and to get to visit her for the long extended visits that I got to enjoy with her. So with thoughts of Jean in mind, our service will open today uh, with uh, an opening hymn. Um, there's three numbers on this board and two numbers on that. Believe this board, uh, which is reflective of your brochures. We'll have the opening hymn, number 884 in the liturgy, after which I'll open the Lord's word as a symbolic way of uh, inviting the Lord's presence into this space, and then we'll go forward from there. Will you rise for our opening song? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I invite you to kneel or be seated in prayer. <clears throat> Dear Lord God, Jesus Christ, at the start of our service this afternoon, our thoughts are with your servant, Jean Melzer, who has now transitioned to the spiritual world. As we think of Jean today, draw our hearts together in our shared love for her. Remind us of your merciful care and providence as you watch over her and us. Help us to imagine her now, her new life as she is now awake in heaven and to look forward to the time when we will cross over and see her again. Be present especially with Jean's family as they continue on through this time of transition toward a good and peaceful shore. Lead us and guide us, Lord, in paths of peace. And now, Lord, hear the prayer that you taught us. 
Our Father, who art in the heavens, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so upon the earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please be seated. For the first part of our service, you're invited to listen to some readings from the Bible and also from the theology of the new church. The first is Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Our next reading is from the Gospel of Matthew, part of chapter 8. Now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my boy will be healed. For I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And I say to you that many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Our next reading is from the Theology of the New Church. It talks about trust in the Lord's leadership and providence in our lives. Those who trust in the divine are not anxious, let alone worried, when they give thought to the morrow. They remain even tempered whether or not they realize their desires and they do not grieve over loss. They are content with their lot. They know that for those who trust trust in the divine, all things are moving toward an everlasting state of happiness, and that no matter what happens to them at any time, it contributes to that state. Our next two readings are about meeting people in the spiritual world who have gone before us. In the other life, all who have been associated in the life of the body meet and talk together in the other world if they so wish, especially husbands and wives, brothers and sisters, but also parents and children, more distant relatives and friends. They meet and talk together whenever they so desire. Swedenborg writes, I have often heard that those who have come from the world rejoice at seeing their friends again, and that their friends in turn rejoice that they had come together. They also congratulate one another. Our next reading is about married partners being reunited in the spiritual world. Those who have lived in true married love are united as to souls, and thence as to minds, and this union being spiritual can never be dissolved. And partners thus united in marriage think and breathe what is eternal. So they are no more two, but one person, that is, one flesh. Such a one cannot be severed by the death of either partner. Therefore, the two are not separated by the death of one, since the spirit of the deceased partner dwells continually with the spirit of the one not yet deceased and this until the death of the latter, when they meet again and reunite, and love each other more tenderly than before, because they are now in the spiritual world. 
Our final reading is from the book of Psalms. I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord to give thanks to the name of the Lord. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Peace be within your walls, prosperity within your palaces. Amen. We're here this afternoon to celebrate the life and character of Jean Foster Melzer. And to begin with, my mind is drawn to that story in the New Testament that we read of the Roman centurion who came to Jesus and begged him to heal his servant who was lying at home paralyzed. When Jesus said, I will come and heal him, the centurion answered, I am not worthy to co- that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my boy will be healed. Jesus marveled at the faith of this foreigner, and he said to him, go your way, and as you have believed, so let it be done for you. And his servant was healed that very hour. It's also remarkable that a Roman centurion figures into the Bible in only one other part of the New Testament narrative. It was at the time of Jesus' death on the cross. So when the centurion guarding Jesus at that time saw the earthquake and saw that Jesus cried out and breathed his last, he feared greatly and said, truly, this man was the son of God. Could it be that the centurion who was present at the Lord's death was the very same centurion that Jesus had helped some time earlier? Wouldn't that be an amazing and wonderful historical fact if it were true? But whether or not the centurion at the cross was the same centurion that Jesus had helped earlier isn't so important. What is important is that what the centurion symbolizes in each one of us, in you and me, is the same at both points in the story. 
Roman centurions were the best, most capable fighting men in the Roman army, and each of them was given command of a thousand foot soldiers, excuse me, a hundred foot soldiers. It's no surprise then that a centurion in the Lord's word symbolizes our emerging and growing faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is a symbol for steadfast faithfulness and trust in the Lord's leadership and providence in our lives. And where does that kind of faithfulness come from? It comes from the Lord himself, who modeled perfect faithfulness to his own divine love and soul within himself and to the divine truth of his own word during his own course of life on earth. Because of his faithfulness during his life on earth, we are able faithfully to know and honor and follow his lead and trust his leadership and providence. With Jean's transition to the other world, it's not just the passing of someone who was over 100 years old. She would have been 102 this very day had she lived that long. In a way, it's also a passing of an era in the Glenview New Church. Because Jean was the third of three what we affectionately called centurions in our congregation who have passed away in the last few years. Vera Kitzelman passing away at 104, Katie Fuller at 103, and now Jean herself at almost 102. It's also remarkable that all three of these women very sadly lost their husbands early in their marriages. Vera in 1950 when she was 35 years old, 69 years before her own transition to the other world. And Katie and Jean both in the same year, 1982, 37 years ago. In addition, these women were left with four, seven, and four children respectively to care for following their husband's passing. All three of these women, each in her own way, and like the centurion in New Testament scripture, would have had to muster courage, faith, and trust in the Lord's leadership and providence, as each one picked up from a great and sad loss and marshaled on through the rest of her life until the day when she would be reunited with her beloved in the Lord's heavenly kingdom. One other remarkable fact about these women is that between the three of them, their lives reflect a total of 308 years of history and experience in this world. Jean Melzer was born an only child in London during World War II on November 30th, 1916. She lived in London for three years before her family moved to Chicago. She lived in Chicago for 10 years before her family then moved in 1929 to Glenview. Jean was 13 years old at that time, and the family bought a home on a four-acre acre parcel of land, almost like a small farm, past Greenwood Road to the west of town. They bought it from Jake Melzer, who was the undertaker in Glenview at that time. Jean would live in that home through all of her growing up years, then through her marriage and family years until she moved to Silver Pines, also in Glenview, in her 80s. Jean attended public school in a one-room schoolhouse. She did so for one day and hated it. So Jean's mom asked around to the Melzer family who she was growing familiar with where Jean could be sent to school. It just so happened that five or six of the Melzer boys at that time and one of their girls attended the Glenview New Church School. And so that is where the family recommended that Jean be sent. The Fosters tried the school for Jean, and Jean liked it. Not long after the family moved, Jean's father left the family. This meant that Jean's mom had to go to work for herself, and she did so as a nanny on the North Shore, which was, off and on, a live-in situation. This meant that at times she needed to find a place for Jean to stay in Glenview. And Ginny Day's family, the Coles, took her in at those times. Jean also took lunches with Katie Fuller's family, the Lees. This combination of events resulted in Jean becoming close, lifelong friends with both Ginny and Katie. Jean attended the Glenview New Church School all the way through grade school. 
Then she attended New Trier High School. The last two years of high school, she too worked as a nanny on the North Shore in Glencoe and Wilmette. Jean graduated from high school in June of 1935. Five months later, at age 19, she married Tom Melzer, who was 10 years her senior. That was during the Great Depression, so Jean used her white dress from graduation as her wedding dress. She was married on Thanksgiving Day, and this meant that the church was decorated for that occasion. And following the church's Thanksgiving service, the pastor invited the congregation to go home and baste the turkey before returning to the wedding. Because of the, the depression, there wasn't much of a reception for the young couple. There were some greetings, a few snapshots were taken, and the couple received two or three wedding gifts. Early on in their marriage, Tom worked for the state of Illinois, driving snow plows in the winter and mowing grass and watering trees in the summer times. Their son, Dennis, was born in 1939, followed by stillborn twins in 1942. Then Derek in 1944, David in 1948, and Edward in 1949. Edward was severely mentally handicapped and needed to be institutionalized. And although he wasn't expected to live past five years, he will be 70 years old this coming December. Jean took Edward's condition pretty hard. It was a real sadness for her, and she never really talked about it much. Jean's other three sons came to the Glenview New Church for a short period of time before they transitioned to public school. And Jean herself continued worshiping here occasionally at the Glenview New Church, especially on holidays. Somewhere along the line, Tom quit working for the state of Illinois and went to work for Swain Nelson Nurseries. He lost that job after the war and went to work for Baxter, which was a big medical company packaging medicines. Somewhere in all of that, Jean got a job at Marshall Field in Evanston and later Old Orchard. She worked at Marshall Field for 15 years the last few years of which she ran the millinery department. In 1959, at age 20, Denny died of electrocution while working for a local tree company. This too was hard on Jean and Tom, and during the remaining years of her life, Jean looked forward to seeing him again in the other world. And she wondered, if he had lived, would he have gotten married? If so, to whom? Would he have had children? And what would he be doing with his life right now? Jean's husband, Tom, passed away in 1982, making him a second family member that Jean looked forward to being reunited with in heaven. There's not a lot to say historically about Jean's latter years. She volunteered a number of years at a hospital gift shop, a couple years later, running the house and property got to be too much for her, and in her 80s, she downsized to a home in Silver Pines. Then she moved to Covenant Village in 2009, and finally, two and a half years ago, to David's home in Wauwatosa, Wisconsin. Jean transitioned to the spiritual world on October 31st of this year, one month shy of her 102nd birthday. Well, what kind of person was Jean? Family members remember her as honest and strong and straight-laced, someone who was able to take life as it came and to do so with a good sense of humor. Jean was independent to an impressive degree. She had a way of handling things that needed to be done. She'd put her mind to whatever needed to get done, and then she'd do it. She learned to drive at, eight, at 13 years of age, driving the car backward and forward in the driveway of her home until it ran out of gas. The next day, a friend of the family took her out and drove around one big block. Jean did just fine in that excursion, so the next day, she got in the car and drove herself to Chicago. Years later, during her marriage, Tom's plowing partner couldn't make it to work one day because he had his wife having a baby that day. So Jean drove the plow truck while Tom shoveled cinders out of the back. Then there was a time when Jean drove into Glenview to get chicken feet at Rugen's. 
When she got into the car to come home, she backed out of her parking space and the car got stuck in reverse. So Jean drove the car all the way down Glenview Road in reverse until she arrived home. On another occasion, Jean dro drove home from the grocery store and her car engine caught on fire. <laughs> so she poured the flour that she just bought at the store on the fire until the fire was put out. Jean just wasn't someone who was easily intimidated. If something needed to get done, she would get it done. The family says that there are many stories like this that prove this point. As a mom, Jean was constant and organized and loving and generous with her time. She read books to the kids while they were growing up, and at times she'd tell them stories of her own childhood. She made special foods and desserts for family members and friends. She was loyal and supportive. She took time to help the kids with their homework and went to school with them and talked with their teachers about them. She didn't lose her temper or swear. David says she could do more with a look than with words to, to let him know if his behavior was unacceptable. At the same time, that good sense of humor that she had allowed her to see the funny side of things. I myself can attest to this. Not long after arriving in Glenview, I was at one of Karn and Bob's family events or New Year's Eve parties. Jean was the kind of person who blended into a crowd more than standing out. And as I made my way around the room meeting people and enjoying their company, I simply missed seeing Jean sitting quietly and unobtrusively in a low chair in the corner of the living room. At one point, I looked her way and saw her there in the corner. She was glaring at me <laughs> like an angry hawk on a tree limb. That glaring look made it patently clear you've really screwed up. Evidently, Jean was hurt, or she thought it inappropriate that I hadn't made it over to simply say hello. No matter, I moved across the room. I knelt down apologetically at her feet and bowed my head before her. I took her right hand in mine and held the back of her hand against my forehead in mock chivalry. Jean saw right through the mirage smiled a, a dubious smile and pulled her hand away as if to say, you big buffoon. <laughs> Truth be told, I got a lot of mileage out of that little antic. From then on till she moved away, any time that I saw Jean seated in a social setting or showing up to a church function, I would stop whatever I was doing, make my way directly to her, bow my head in a show of humility, and touch the back of her hand to my forehead. She never stopped smiling and chortling over that little antic. As a mom, Jean was also adventurous. She went camping with the kids and family when they were young. She liked to explore and shop and look at things and go to museums. She was always there for the kids, a faithful, steadfast mom. One of the kids said, mom was helpful. She often seemed to know what we wanted before we asked, and she wasn't one to tell us what she herself liked, disliked, or preferred. Jean was a grandma to five children, Mark, Nathan, Andrew, Nikki, and Julia. And she's remembered by them as someone who liked cooking, had great stories to tell, especially growing up in Glenview, and who was fun to be around. Andrew remembers her cooking him hot dogs every day when, he lived, when they lived across the street. He also remembers her using a garden shovel to push him in his big wheel. Andrew and Julia both remember how grandma could throw a baseball. She had a great yard to play in and where she, and, uh, where she would play ball with them. Grandma could throw a ball harder and more accurately than Andrew and at times zipping it hard enough to hurt his hand through his glove. Jean loved children and family. She cared deeply about her mom. She also cared about friendships. As I mentioned earlier, she was close friends with Ginny Day and Katie Fuller. Ginny, who was in her same class through grade school and whose home she had lived in for a number of those school years. 
In fact, the day children all grew up calling her Aunt Jean, and they still do to this day. And for the last 20 years that she had lived in Glenview, Bob and Karen Day Steller had Aunt Jean over regularly for Sunday dinner with them and Ginny. Bob faithfully did Aunt Jean's shopping for her, and he went to check in on her and visit several times a week. As for Jean and Katie, the two of them were one year apart in school. They were in each other's weddings. The family has one or more pictures of them pushing baby carts together. And the Fuller, Fuller and Melzer families were back and forth for Thanksgiving dinners for a number of years. Jean and Katie loved each other dearly. And theirs was a treasured friendship that spanned almost 90 years. Jean wasn't a very outspoken person, and she grew more and more quiet in her later years. This might have left an unknowing observer or acquaintance with a sense that she was something of an introvert. But people who knew her better knew that was far from the truth. When Jean was a little girl, she was subject to ear infections that gave her hearing loss from a young age. By the time she reached her later years, she was completely deaf in the right ear, blind in the right eye, and needed a hearing aid for her other ear. These things made it understandably difficult for her to engage in conversations and made her appear standoffish and disinterested. And yet she fully enjoyed the company of others and being included in things. She had a great memory and loved talking about the early days in Glenview. She built friendships wherever she went, especially the hospital where she did her volunteer work and also at Covenant Village when she lived there. I myself enjoyed long, leisurely lunchtime visits and conversations with her while she still lived in Glenview. Wherever she moved, she'd say to the family, I can't move. I'll be leaving all of my friends behind. Jean made friends wherever she went. So family and friends were important to Jean. She also loved to travel and she loved animals. She and Tom did some traveling prior to his passing to places like Hazelhurst, Wisconsin, and also England. At some point, Tom grew tired of traveling, but Jean kept right on going. She traveled with Katie to Hawaii and Alaska and the Canadian Rockies, with Charlene and some of her church friends and church choir to Alaska and Coventry, England, to Utah to see one of Charlene's daughters, to Yellowstone and to Walt Disney World. She loved animals, especially dogs, and animals evidently loved her. At times, when Jean visited family members or friends that had a dog, she'd come away from those visits, and it was the dog that she most often talked about. And to all appearances, the dogs often liked Jean better than they liked their own masters. Jean always had a dog herself, and she loved telling stories to the grandkids about all the dogs that she had had growing up. Sometimes Jean would, often to take care, would offer to take care of family members and friends' dogs, and when she did, she tended to spoil them. She'd feed them way too much food of whatever she had in the house, like steak and other such things. If family members or friends raised a concern with her, her response was simple. My house? my rules. And that was the end of it. One fun story involved her beloved dog, Spirit, a fluffy white Samoyed. It was Easter or Palm Sunday one year, and Jean had made three banana cream pies to bring to Charlene's house for a family dinner. She'd put two of them in the back seat of the car and went back into the house to get the third one. When she came back out, Spirit had jumped into the car, thinking he was going for a ride. Banana cream pie all over everything. The car, Aunt Jean, and the dog. Needless to say, Jean was pretty upset about that. But looking back, it was something that she laughed about often for the rest of her life. David, too, had a dog, and when Jean moved to Wisconsin, she spent the last few years of her life patting the head of a pair of loving eyes that looked up at her from her lap. So Jean loved family and friends. She loved to travel, and she loved animals. 
She also loved gardening and some of the finer things in life, like fine furnishings and English china and beautiful textiles and handmade items. She loved knitting and needle pointing. She knitted beautiful sweaters and afghans and needle pointed beautiful tapestries. She enjoyed music, attending concerts with family members and going to blockbuster video to rent movies with the grandkids. But now all of that is over. By now, Jean has been wide awake and active in the spiritual world for nearly two months. No doubt by now she has been reunited with her mom and her husband Tom and her dear departed son Denny. Just imagine all the catching up that the two of them have to do. Jean's hearing has now returned to her and her sight is sharper than we can imagine, making it easy to catch up with old friends like Ginny and Katie. I can't imagine Vera won't be there as well, welcoming Jean to the other world and congratulating her on her arrival. Reflecting again on the Roman centurion in New Testament scripture, he was a literal historical figure who had no idea that his faith and faithfulness would serve as a symbol for these same qualities in you and me and all of humanity for all time to come. At the same point in history, excuse me, at some point in history, that centurion himself would have passed away and transitioned to the spiritual world. When he did, I can only imagine how happy the angels would have been to welcome him and to rejoice in his own brand of faithfulness being added to the collective whole of heaven. Likewise, I can only imagine the happiness and rejoicing of the angels as they have now welcomed our own three beloved, faithful centurions, Vera Kitzelman, Katie Fuller, and Jean Melzer also Ginny Day, into the loving embrace of the world to come. Well done, good and faithful servants. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Amen. <laughs>
invite you to kneel or be seated in prayer. Dear Lord God, Jesus Christ, we thank you for the life, character, and memory of Jean Melzer, who has newly arrived in your spiritual world and who is now committed into your eternal care. We ask that you be with her as she makes her final transition to her eternal home. Help her to feel your love for her more surely and deeply than ever before. Lift her up and inspire her with eternal truths that point ever more clearly to you and to goodness in life. Touch her heart with love for you and for others around her. Strengthen her in character and in a life of useful service so that she may more deeply fulfill eternal purposes that you have in store. Be with us as well, and especially with Jean's family as they depart from this service and as they look forward to being reunited with Jean again in the life to come. Lead us and guide us, Lord, in paths of peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Please rise.
go down and she made her match on the whole I said, oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it was beautiful. Thank you. I heard you two weeks because you were, uh, you sang at Blue Circus too, didn't you? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. Deb Laney. Pleasure oh, to meet you. Nice to meet you. Yes, I recognize the face. So I yes, know, yes, I have seen you before, yeah. yes.
need to try to get there before the usher pulls that thing down so I can run.